Okay, I think uh, we've got uh, enough folks that have filtered in, so I think uh, we can uh, go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining. Welcome to this DC SEU webinar, Introduction to Building Science. Uh, my name is Ajit Naik. I am a, a senior uh, energy and commissioning engineer with Bauman Consulting uh, right here in Washington, DC. Um, I've got with me here today my colleague, Oliver Bauman, um, who will be uh, assisting me with this presentation. So I appreciate you for, for making the time and, uh, and joining us here today. This presentation is probably going to go for uh, about, we have an hour and a half today. Um, we'll stop about 15 minutes early to take any questions that we have at the end. As we go through this presentation, I definitely like you guys to stay engaged. If you have any questions, please go ahead and uh, type them in the box. Um, I'm gonna stop periodically and uh, Oliver will read me um, any questions that come through as, uh, as we go along. But uh, again, as I said, uh, we'll have 15 minutes at the end where uh, we'll unmute the, uh, uh, everybody's microphones and everybody will have a chance to, uh, to ask questions live. But um, um, without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll get started. Um, so today uh, we have a few different learning objectives. Um, we want to um, really understand what building science is, get a, get a brief introduction to it. We want to understand the physical phenomena impacting buildings and the elements comprising a whole building system. We want to understand key performance metrics and indicators for assessing building performance. Um, we want to understand how building enclosures and building systems influence building performance. And we want to understand how an integrated approach to incorporating the enclosure, the building environment, and the HVAC systems can uh, maximize building performance. Um, so uh, real quick, uh, I wanted to, before we get started, to understand uh, what are the backgrounds of those in the audience? Um, Oliver, if you wouldn't mind launching the poll, uh, we'll just leave it open for uh, maybe about 30 seconds to, to see what, uh, what everyone says. Okay, oh, question one is launched. We see sustainability professionals, building owners, engineers, and a couple others. No architects and no students so far. And I think we are complete. Okay. All right, let's give one more second. All right, thank you. All right, it looks like we have a pretty good mix today. Uh, we have some engineers, we have some sustainability professionals, we have some building owners, and uh, we have others. I'm curious if those of you who are uh, from other backgrounds, if you could uh, maybe write in the comments what your background is, just so we can uh, so we can understand who you all have with us today. Thank you. All right. Um, from that perspective, I'm uh, I'm going to start from the basics. So, what is building science? Um, so building science is the, I asked Wikipedia, you know, the source of all knowledge in uh, the modern era, and it came back with, building science is the collection of scientific knowledge that focuses on the analysis of the physical phenomena that affect in buildings. So it's a mouthful, but it really got me thinking, um, what is a building? Uh, getting a little bit philosophical here, but a building represents, again, for Wikipedia, a physical division, contact, place of comfort and safety in the outside a place that may sometimes be harsh and harmful. It really represents that, that separation of environments. Um, so building science is the study of, of buildings as a system. Uh, so systems theory, uh, it's a branch of mathematics. They define a system as being a group of components that's influenced by its environment, defined by its structure, and expressed through its functioning. So that really is applicable to buildings. Um, buildings are influenced by its exterior environment, but also by its inhabitants, you know, people, plants, and animals. And uh, it's influenced by its structure, like its building enclosure, and it's uh, expressed through its function, like its building services. And really, these enclosures serve to separate the indoors and outdoors, and uh, the building services seek to moderate the, uh, the enclosed environment that we created on the indoors. And building science really focuses on the systems approach to building technology and uh, to advance the high performance building agenda. So we're gonna talk today about how we can uh, work to modify the building enclosure and building services to influence these interior environments. Um, so now that we've got the idea of a building as a system, we wanna understand really what are the physical phenomenon impacting these systems. Um, there's really five main phenomena that, that impact these. Um, we have heat flows, um, which always works from hot to cold. 
We have air flows, which always occur from high pressure areas to low pressure areas. We have moisture flows, which always occur from warm and wet to cool and dry. Um, we have solar radiation, which always provides light and heat. And we have noise and vibrations uh, from external and internal sources. So these are the phenomena that impact building systems that we have to consider. And these things can vary seasonally. Um, so they change from where we are in the country, but they can also change from winter to summer. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, heat flows impact buildings because they impact how hot and cold it is inside, which is one of the things that people care about the most. Um, there are a few different types of heat transfer that exist that impact buildings. Um, there's conduction. Uh, that's the type of heat transfer that happens when you touch a solid at a different temperature, like a hot stove or an ice cube. Um, there's convection. That's the different type of heat transfer that happens when a fluid of a different temperature uh, flows over you, like uh, when you take a warm shower or you step out into a brisk winter breeze. Um, radiation is the heat transfer that happens by uh, radiant exchange, when there's something that's much different temperature nearby in your field of view, kind of like when you sit in front of a campfire and feel that heat wash over you. Um, these types of uh, uh, heat flows also impact buildings too. Um, there are, uh, uh, for example, conduction losses through the floor uh, into the ground, uh, Anybody have a cold basement can uh, probably attest to this. Um, there are convection losses um, off the windows and surfaces on a cold, windy day. Ever try touching the window in February, you'll know what I mean. And there's a uh, radiation gains from the, from the sun to the windows, making hot spots onto the floor. There's a cat in this picture here. My cat also knows all about that too. Um, you want to control the heat flows into and out of a building so you can separate the outside from the inside. Uh, this is one of the primary functions of both the building enclosure, first and foremost, as well as the, uh, the building uh, MEP systems as well. Um, we also, another physical impact uh, phenomenon impacting buildings is uh, that we discussed is, is air flows. Um, air flows uh, uh, occur for many different reasons. Um, there's typically, there's two main types of air flows in the building, um, uncontrolled um, air flow, which is called infiltration, it's typically not desired, something you want to combat. And then there's ventilation. That's intentional uh, introduction of air flows into the building. That's uh, you typically desire to maintain air quality, which we'll, uh, we'll discuss a little bit later. But um, it's important to note the, uh, the sources of undesired uh, air flows into building, um, uh, that infiltration. Uh, the first of those is wind effects. Um, as we discussed, air flows always from high pressure regions to low pressure regions. So on windy days, uh, you know, gusts of wind hit the windward side of a building and it creates a high pressure region relative to the indoors. So as you're seeing on the screen here, the high pressure region, um, and there's a sort of a lower pressure region indoors. And this forces uh, air through the cracks and causes drafts inside of buildings. On the leeward side, the back side of the building away, we have kind of a lower pressure that really sucks air through the cracks in the facade out. So what this ends up causing is infiltration in the form of a draft. So in warm, uh, humid days, like we've got outside right now, uh, we get moisture and sort of warm air leaking in. And in the winter, we get cold, drafty air leaking in. And this causes us to you know, use more energy and causes just general discomfort. Uh, another source of infiltration in buildings is the stack effect. Um, this happens during cold weather when heat rises to the top of the building. We all know that heat rises. Um, it goes through stairwells shafts and other openings uh, uh, throughout the building and it creates a higher pressure region at the top. Um, this hot air tends to escape through cracks in the roof, open windows, um, etc. and it creates basically a vortex where lower pressure uh, from lower levels uh, comes in through open doors, open windows, cold air, heats up and rises out of the top of buildings. So if you've ever noticed that uh, um, when you go to the, the, like a, the, the store or something on a cold day, Sometimes it's tough to open the door. Uh, that's the stack effect uh, uh, preventing you from being able to do that. Um, lastly, uh, there's, com uh, there's combustion and ventilation. So there's desired ventilation that needs to happen in buildings to maintain air quality and to provide you know, gases for fireplaces, for furnaces, water heaters, and other sources of, of combustion inside of buildings. Um, so typically, uh, ventilation for these purposes is uh, introduced by mechanical means, like through an HVAC system, or through natural means uh, through windows. But generally, um, you want to control these air flows into and out of buildings. You want to minimize um, undesirable airflow and make sure that the uh, desired airflow is, is, is well controlled. 
And again, this is one of the primary functions of the building enclosure, as well as the building systems. Uh, the third physical phenomenon that we discuss uh, that impacts uh, uh, buildings and building systems significantly is, is moisture flows. We discussed heat flows and air flows, but now we discuss moisture. Uh, moisture can enter buildings in a few primary ways. Um, uh, one of the significant ways that it can enter is just through garden variety leaks. Uh, that's when there are just cracks or gaps in the building. It's not watertight and it allows moisture to penetrate. Um, uh, moisture can penetrate typically through the foundations of the building. It can uh, uh, penetrate through the cladding, the millwork, through penetrations, through improperly sealed windows, through balconies that don't drain. There are many areas that it can happen, but that's one of the primary ways of moisture infiltration um, into buildings. Um, secondly, is, uh, is capillary action. So capillary action is when you have porous materials, typically concrete, concrete block, or brick, um, where water from the exterior or from the underground uh, starts to filter into those pores through capillary action and, uh, and enters the building space. So you definitely want to control moisture flows into and out of a building again, um, keep things dry on the interior for the air quality, but also prevent the walls from rotting. And again, uh, this is one of the primary functions of the building enclosure, first and foremost. Um, it's not just leaks and capillary action bringing water into the building, though. There's also a phenomenon called vapor drive that, uh, that impacts moisture penetration into buildings. So uh, this is just the tendency of water to move from warm and wet regions to cool and dry regions. Um, if you're familiar with osmosis, where, you know, uh, fresh water mixes with salty water. It's a really similar phenomenon to that. Um, temperature is really what drives uh, moisture, uh, uh, this moisture migration. Temperature differences more than 20 Fahrenheit really, really drive uh, uh, this moisture, uh, uh, really uh, enhance this vapor drive. Uh, hot and humid conditions make it worse as well. So typically, it depends how this works, uh, depends on your local conditions. So for example, in, uh, in cold climates, uh, the vapor drive primarily occurs uh, from the interior to the exterior. So inside of your buildings where you have people, plants, animals, you're maintaining warm temperatures, you're cooking, um, there's a lot of humidity indoors relative to the outdoors where it's very, very cold. Uh, on the flip side, in, in hot and humid climates like we've got in DC outside right now, it's hot, humid, and muggy outside, and the vapor drive is gonna drive from the exterior to the interior where we have uh, air conditioned interiors and, and hot and humid exteriors. Um, so understanding vapor drive is, 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 is very significant when you wanna control moisture flows into and out of buildings. And as mentioned, it depends on where you are. Um, our, uh, in our country, we basically have uh, the full gamut of, 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 of climate ranges. Uh, we have hot and humid climates, we have cold and wet uh, climates, we have cold and dry climates. Um, so designing enclosures to account for how vapor drive acts in your neck of the woods is really critical. Uh, you know, what flies in Fargo, North Dakota might not fly in New Orleans, Louisiana. So keeping that in mind is, is very critical and we'll discuss that a little bit down the line. Um, lastly, uh, we discussed solar radiation. Um, I know that I mentioned that uh, uh, radiation is a, uh, is a type of heat transfer. And so it is, uh, but the sun's impact is unique enough that it uh, works us up. It's worth a separate mention. Um, really, uh, there are three types of radiation that uh, um, that, that are that concern buildings. There's direct radiation, um, which is you know what you feel when the sun hits you directly. It provides the strongest uh, amount of light and heat. Um, there's diffuse radiation. What happens when light is scattered off of clouds or dust or other sources in the environment and kind of filters in. I mean, it provides a lot less heat, but it provides a very desirable kind of background level of natural light. Um, lastly, there's a, a reflective light. Uh, that's uh, what, what reflects off the ground. It's very important in urban contexts and also high albedo uh, conditions, like snowy conditions. And uh, albedo is just a fancy word for, uh, for ground. Um, solar radiation is a significant source of heat in, in buildings. Uh, much of America, including DC, receives more than four kilowatt hours of energy per day per square yard of your roof. Um, that's a lot of heat. That's the amount of heat that's uh, emitted by a space heater running on full blast for three hours. And again, that's just per yard per day. So uh, maintaining and managing solar radiation, both as an opportunity as well uh, when it's desirable, 
and, uh, and managing its influence when it's not desirable, when it's hot outside, is again critical for, uh, for building science and managing the proper performance of buildings. Um, lastly, uh, we discussed uh, noise and vibrations. Um, so noise and vibrations uh, um, impact buildings in a different way. Um, largely, there are two means for it. There's uh, sources of noise and vibrations inside of the building, uh, mostly that come from the HVAC system, moving fans, pumps, generators, compressors. Uh, they have lots of different paths uh, that they can come through. They can come through the floor. They can come through duct works. They can come through directly the walls. Um, so Considering the sources of noise within the building and how they travel through the building, again, is, is, is critical to controlling noise and vibrations within buildings. Um, and lastly, uh, we have uh, sounds from the outside. Uh, traffic noises, traffic vibrations, uh, um, you know, neighboring buildings, uh, uh, these all impact the, uh, the acoustic environment. Buildings. Um, so I'm gonna stop here before we continue and uh, um, just see if there's any questions that have, uh, um, that folks have a, a chance to ask. So um, again, I'm not gonna unmute folks, but if you have anything, uh, you can go ahead and type them in. Um, Oliver, do we have any open questions at this point? Uh, no open questions. There was one question about whether the presentation will be shared and I responded in the Q and A, yes, it's recorded um, and it will be shared through the DCSEU website um, at a later point. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, if there are no questions on this section, I uh, will move on. So we've just now uh, reviewed the physical phenomenon impacting buildings. Um, again, we've discussed heat flows, air flows, moisture flows, solar radiation, and noise and vibrations. Um, so now that we've taken the time to understand what these physical phenomena that impact buildings are, um, I want to pause here and uh, ask the audience a question. Um, so. Really, what's most important to you in a high-performance building, or really, what's important to you about buildings generally? Um, Oliver, if you can go ahead. I'll again leave this open for about 30 seconds while folks have a chance to answer whether they value aesthetics, environmental separation, sustainability, economy, health and safety, or comfort. Really, what's important to you um, in your buildings, both the buildings that you occupy, um, as well as the buildings that you own and the buildings that you live All right, I'll leave it open for the polls are hot. I'll give folks another another 10 seconds to respond and, uh, and then we can move on. Yeah, answers are still coming in. Um, sustainability seems to be the front runner, followed by health and safety, comfort, economy, and environmental separation. No aesthetics. Um, so I'll empty poll now. There's no more movement. Okay. All right. Share Good. the results. All right, thanks, Oliver. Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, this shows the, the kind of who the group is here today. You know, we are, uh, after all, at a webinar of the DC Sustainable Energy Utility, so I'm glad that we have a focus on sustainability. Um, second most is, uh, is health and safety, uh, third is comfort, and uh, I'm glad to see that economy is, uh, uh, comes a little bit later. That's, uh, that's unusual for a group to focus on buildings. Um, from a building science perspective, that leads us into the, uh, the hierarchy of building needs. So what makes a successful building? Uh, so the way to read this pyramid is actually from the bottom up, right? So first and foremost, important from a building science perspective is health and safety uh, uh, requirements, you know, fire protection, structural integrity. Um, we all saw what happened in, uh, uh, in Florida, you know, a couple of months ago. Um, so these are kind of the minimum requirements for even having a building. Um, if you don't have these, you do not pass go. We can't talk about what uh, any success beyond that. Next, we typically prioritize environmental separation and moderation. So, you know, that's controlling those uh, uh, those uh, different physical phenomena that we uh, uh, that we discussed, and also kind of influencing that moderating uh, that indoor environment after we separate it. Thirdly, is sustainability, uh, and that's that's sustainability writ large. You know, the durability, the resilience, the environmental impact, and the economy. All of that is kind of like a third tier on our, on our hierarchy. And last is, uh, is aesthetics. You know, um, this, this, this pyramid can cause it, you know, acoustic, visual, tactile comfort. We kind of confl conflate those and also include occupant well-being. But as designers, um, as building scientists, our due diligence is to consider these hierarchies of needs and disorder. Um, to kind of simplify it and make it uh, to further today's discussion, I want to discuss how we can uh, really quantify it. 
buildings, right? So how can we measure building performance? It's all and well to talk about buildings as a system, to discuss physical phenomenon, to you know talk about hierarchies of needs. But here I will kind of want to get to the to the brass tacks, right? Really, uh, you know, how can we measure successful building performance? How can we how is it defined? Um, how is it quantified? And how can we kind of look at our own buildings and our own projects and kind of point to say, this is a successful building and here's how I'm, uh, basically how I'm proving it. Um, there's two real main categories that those hierarchies of needs can be, uh, can be broken down into. They are indoor environmental quality, uh, you know, so the success that the building has in separating the environments, um, moderating them, and providing a aesthetically pleasing, comfortable, healthy, and safe environment. And secondly, we kind of have building resource use, which speaks to the sustainability of the building. So it's the energy use of the building, the water use of the building, the carbon emissions of the building, and also the financial and economic performance of the building, you know, how well it can continue to operate. Because, you know, if, it, uh, uh, if the building can operate, uh, you know, at a high level, it, it won't continue to also perform uh, well from an IEQ perspective or a building resources perspective. So all of the physical phenomenon that we discussed previously, heat flows, moisture flows, air flows, um, uh, the solar radiation and noise and vibration all impact buildings ability to maintain indoor environmental quality and building resource usage. So um, I wanna take a few minutes to go through all of these criteria in detail and kind of discuss how the physical properties can impact each of these uh, uh, basically key desires and also what the role of the building enclosure and the building systems are in moderating and providing high performance levels for each one of these performance indicators. Um, so first I wanna talk about indoor air quality. Um, I know I've used the CO2 icon here, but um, it's important to realize that indoor air quality is more than just about, uh, uh, about CO2. Um, there's lots of things that impact indoor air quality and there's lots of people who have lots of different opinions on it. Um, so what I'm showing on the screen here is a handy table. It's uh, from the Ashley standard 62.1, uh, which is a standard about uh, uh, air quality and ventilation in buildings. And it shows uh, on the top lo what lots of different organizations say about what acceptable levels of indoor pollutants are. So we have values from the EPA, from OSHA, from the Canadian references, from uh, European references, and from world references as well. Um, lots of these values are pretty similar, um, uh, but uh, there are different uh, uh, standards and resources that can impact the buildings. Um, there's lots of different things that people are concerned about. Um, there's carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, lead, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, particulate matters of 2.5 microns and smaller, particulate matters of, five point, of 10 microns and smaller, radon, sulfur dioxide. There's lots of things to worry about that can cause um, air quality uh, uh, requirement, uh, basically issues. Um, one interesting thing to note is that carbon dioxide standards aren't really given, uh, um, uh, put out that way. Uh, there are guidelines that different orga organizations provide uh, about it, but uh, for example, the EPA doesn't really set carbon dioxide limits um, annually. Um, so uh, as just a brief discussion, um, Ashley, uh, the American Society of Heating and Refrigerating Engineers, and REVA, uh, the European equivalent, both recommend about a thousand parts per minute, uh, excuse me, a thousand parts per million as a, the recommended concentration, maximum concentration of carbon dioxide in indoor spaces. So at any uh, uh, level higher than that, um, CO2 levels of 12, 13, 1400 ppm can start to cause drowsiness, uh, lack of productivity, uh, headaches, um, other sort of undesirable effects in building occupants, sometimes called sick building syndrome. Um, so typically a uh, thousand ppm is, is what you kind of want to shoot for. Uh, one interesting thing to note is that a lot of modern research in the last year and a half since we've been uh, living with the COVID-19 pandemic is an association between carbon dioxide and uh, um, uh, levels within spaces and uh, uh, bacterial and viral load within spaces. So there have been studies that have been done in the last few years that kind of correlate CO2 levels with how much bacterial and viral load can be within spaces. So both Ashley and Reva have recommended that 
during pandemic conditions um, that that CO2 level be reset from 1,000 ppm indoors to 800 ppm indoors. And uh, in our experience, we've seen uh, major corporate clients um, who uh, have uh, uh, CO2 monitoring systems inside of their buildings generally do this as well, go from levels in the 1,000 to 1,200 range down to the 700 to 800 range uh, in maintaining air quality within their buildings. Um, other things to look at are particulate matter, um, especially in projects on the on the West Coast where there are uh, um, wildfire and other natural disasters that impact air quality. Um, the OSHA levels are typically used by, by standards around. Um, that's uh, about 15 microns per cubic meter in a year. That's the exposure that uh, people should be, should be getting at maximum. Um, standards like the well uh, building standard, which is a standard for uh, healthy indoor environments also follow, follow OSHA guidelines. Typically, you'll also hear about VOCs, volatile organic component, uh, compounds. Uh, the concentration levels for those are, are similar, um, allowable for CO2, about 1,000 ppm uh, uh, for an acceptability criteria interval. Um, outside of those, there are other, thing, other ways that uh, um, the building enclosure can influence, influence indoor uh, air quality. One of the major sources of particulate matter in buildings is mold, um, right? So, and one of the major sources of mold is condensation inside of building enclosures. So we discussed previously that vapor drive is, uh, you know, moves moisture from warm, wet regions, you know, from the outside in hot climates or from the inside in cold climates, yeah, uh, through the wall. Um, if uh, moisture gets trapped inside of walls in relatively cold areas, it can cause condensation, just like dew on grass outside. And uh, when condensation happens inside of walls, it starts rotting things. It starts rotting wood, it starts rotting insulation, the other building components, which generally creates mold, mold spores, and other particulate matter. So um, regardless of how airtight and watertight your building is, it's really important that you put that vapor barrier uh, that blocks that vapor drive in the right location. Um, typical wisdom says that in cold climates, you put that vapor barrier, you know, close to the inside. So you trap moisture from the inside of the building, inside, away from the wall. And in hot climates, you would put that vapor barrier towards the outside of the wall, you know, to treat, trap that humidity and heat outside of the wall. Um, however, there are other strategies. For example, in a place like DC, what do you do when you have a really cold climate for three months out of the year and a really hot climate for six months out of the year? Um, there are strategies that can, uh, um, that, that can suit both. For example, as you see on the screen here, um, we have a wall system that has rigid insulation where it says number two and a steel frame wall um, on the right side. There is a air and vapor barrier right here represented by the orange line. So in cold climates, what happens is the, the moisture during the winter, moisture and heat from the inside before it can enter the insulation, is trapped. And uh, it's, it's, the, it's trapped in the warm region of the wall, so no condensation occurs. Meanwhile, during the, uh, uh, the summer season, the heat and the moisture from the outside is trapped outside where it can breathe and moisture, if it forms, can drain away um, out without entering the building. It again keeps the wall dry. Um, so there are strategies um, uh, for air and vapor barrier placement in building enclosures that can prevent condensation indoors um, in climates that switch back and forth that can maintain, uh, uh, lead to maintaining a better indoor air quality. Ajit, we have one question about um, air quality. Please go ahead. And the question is, what is the source of formaldehyde in buildings? A great question. Um, and that leads to my next point is how else building enclosures can influence air quality. So as we get uh, more and more airtight buildings that uh, you know, control infiltration and control air flows, the stuff that's inside of buildings um, can really uh, uh, can give off off gas, uh, can uh, leach uh, uh, stuff that's in them into the environment. And that's a major source of VOCs like formaldehyde inside of buildings. So things like office furniture that has plastic in it, um, fresh off the factory floor, a carpet uh, that's you know been rolled up and shipped uh, when it gets installed and it starts airing out. Uh, things like paint uh, when they're put on walls and they dry over the course of weeks can contain uh, elements like this. Um, so there, it's more than just formaldehyde that uh, that you have to worry about. 
Um, so there are lots of different resources, but a really great uh, resource is the IFLI, the Institute, uh, uh, the, the I, excuse me, the, I actually forget what they stand for, uh, forgive me all, the Living Future Institute, excuse me, International Living Future Institute. They maintain a, uh, a red list of chemicals that should be banned from indoors. Um, this is really uh, the, the basically the highest performance level that you can look at, the best in class that you can do, uh, but it's a really great a standard and guideline for as you go through and design. Uh, but as I mentioned, big ticket items and furniture, finishes, including carpet and, uh, and paint. Um, so uh, there's a large list. I've only included uh, part of it here. It ranges from everything from asbestos to chlorobenzene, chlorinated polymers, organic compounds, PCBs. Uh, some of these uh, are worse than others. Um, some of them are, are you know, allowed and only banned in California, as you see on the tags. But generally, if you're concerned about indoor air quality, this is kind of a be all end all list of things that you should exclude from your buildings. Um, this is a pretty nascent industry, uh, the idea of considering red list items. But there also is an, uh, an increase in proliferation of product labeling. Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, architects might know that, you know, when you go to Home Depot, you'll see performance labels for, say, windows. You'll see a U-value label on how well that, that window performs. Or, you know, when you go to buy a new uh, refrigerator, it might have an Energy Star label on it that lets you know it's energy efficient. So um, there, there are different programs now that are starting uh, product labeling for uh, red list chemicals. One of them, for example, is the Declare label, which is also put out by the IFLI. So uh, manufacturers who make things like paints, carpets, really anything uh, that goes inside of buildings are able to have their products uh, listed, vetted, tested by a third party and, uh, and uh, furnished with a declare label that says this product is free of red list chemicals and can be installed in buildings without uh, you know, any concern. Um, so the IFLI has a standard called the Living Building Standard, uh, Living Building Challenge, uh, which is a certification program for buildings. But even if you're not pursuing a standards like that, but are concerned about air quality in your buildings, this is a great place for, for people to start. Um, so, you know, airtight envelopes, they help, um, but it really creates the requirement to pay attention to what you're putting inside of buildings. Um, this also uh, leads to how building systems can influence indoor air quality. Um, so there's a few means. So obviously, no matter how much we separate our environment, we need to bring in some air from the outside. Uh, people need fresh air. Uh, CO2, as when it builds up, can cause you know, problems with sick building syndrome. Um, there's going to always be a desire for there to be fresh air by occupants inside. Um, there are three real main ways of doing this. Um, there's natural ventilation. Uh, there's mechanical ventilation. That's through an HVAC system. There's hybrid ventilation, which is both through windows as well as through uh, HVAC systems entirely. Um, natural ventilation is great because it doesn't use any energy. You just open your windows. Um, mechanical ventilation, a little bit less great. Um, it uh, uh, takes energy, but we all know you can't just leave your windows open, for example, on a day like today when it's super hot outside. Um, important ways to mitigate the, this necessary ventilation, the energy impact, the sustainability impact is energy recovery ventilation. Um, this is basically when on a really hot day, like today, when it's you know, cold inside, it's 70 degrees inside and it's you know, 95 and crazy sticky hot outside, you need to bring that outdoor air in, uh, but you don't wanna spend energy in conditioning it. You can use energy recovery ventilation. Uh, this is a device, it's a heat exchanger. It basically takes in that fresh air uh, from outside, which is hot and humid, and it passes it through a heat exchanger with the air you suck out, the stale air you suck out from inside. It pre-cools the air, and it allows you to bring in air that's a, a little bit tempered rather than bringing it directly from the outside. Also works really well in the winter, you know, when it's you know, 30, 32 degrees outside and it's 75 degrees and toasty inside. You don't want to bring in air directly. It allows you to mitigate that uh, the energy penalty of the required ventilation inside of your spaces. So building systems can influence indoor air quality. They're required to influence indoor air quality, but uh, how you implement them can also control their sustainability impact. Um, buildings just so uh, we know that we need to uh, bring in ventilation, but uh, how much of it do we really need to bring in? Um, there are local codes uh, that define that. Um, there are minimum ventilation rates for different space types. Uh, in DC here, we uh, use the International Mechanical Code. 
um, which provides, you know, for each, uh, each any space type you can imagine, you know, uh, residential rooms, living rooms, offices, conference rooms, classrooms of different sites. There are dozens and dozens of categories where there are recommended levels of outside air to bring in that would be, uh, um, that would maintain those healthy levels of CO2, VOCs, particulate matter that we discussed previously. Um, so there's supposed to be enough, um, but, you know, buildings change, you know, you know, a conference room that has two people in it is different from a conference room that has 10 people in it, right? So sometimes building systems need to provide more air than required to, uh, to maintain good air quality, but um, this uses a lot of energy. Um, a good strategy to doing this and controlling the energy penalty of bringing in more air is monitoring. Um, there's a huge variety of uh, air quality monitors available on the market today um, that can check things like CO2 levels, particulates, VOCs, all of those things that we discussed and provide feedback. Um, they can either directly control the HVAC system by bringing in more air uh, when it's needed, um, or it can be a lot simpler, such as just letting occupants know, um, you know when there are times of, of, of poor indoor air quality. And when there are times of poor indoor air quality, occupant, um, occupants can simply open the windows. Um, so there are low-tech ways of doing it and there are high-tech ways of doing it. But uh, the monitoring and the influence of building systems are, are essential to moderating indoor air quality. Archit, we have one related question. Um, sure. The question is, are there any standards for natural ventilation? Um, yes, there are. So the local code, for example, that I showed here um, that shows minimum ventilation rates provides uh, um, minimum area requirements, right? So for, uh, if you have a certain floor area of, of a kitchen, it'll tell you how big your window needs to be as a percentage of that floor area to provide adequate ventilation. So local codes usually do have that, but when you get to more complex situations or situations where you're designing a hybrid ventilation that combines natural and um, mechanical ventilations, uh, you need to do more detailed studies and analysis to to really figure out how these interplay. But as a starting point, local codes do provide that information as well. Um, all right, if there are no more questions about air quality, we can move on to thermal comfort. So I discussed air quality first because that's kind of a health and human safety thing. You know, it's not just about comfort, it's also about, uh, about safety. Um, thermal comfort, also similar as well. Um, so I wanna start this out by asking another question here. So um, to everybody, uh, what is a comfortable thermostat standpoint? Yeah, what do you think is comfortable? What's comfortable for you when you're inside of a building? I'm gonna leave this up for about 30 seconds here for folks to go ahead and, uh, and provide their responses. Looks like they're coming in hot. And this is a, <laughs> this is a, a controversial one too usually. Looks like we've got about half the folks answered. If, uh, Anybody else wants to answer the poll question while it's still live, we'll give folks another 10 seconds. All right, you wanna run it, Oliver? Yeah, I think we are complete. I yeah, just got one more, so I'm ending the poll now. Okay. So we Actually, have- I'll let you discuss the results. Yes, thank you. We have answers from 65, 70, 72. Most people say 70 or 72, but a few folks say 75, and a couple of folks say it depends. Um, so uh, I like the folks who answered it depends because really that's the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is what a comfortable thermostat set point is, is subjective. It varies from person to person, and it also depends even for one person on uh, a bunch of factors. So um, it leads to a, a really important question is what factors impact thermal comfort? Um, so this guy that you're looking at on the screen here is a, a Dutch, uh, excuse me, a Danish professor called Pavel Olefanger. And he had the same question of what factors impact thermal comfort back in the 60s. Um, he was a pioneer of thermal comfort and, and perception of IEQ and uh, had a seminal 1967 study where he got a bunch of college kids in a room for three hours he basically changed a bunch of things in the room and uh, asked them to provide their feedback uh, and, uh, and, and quantify uh, a thermal comfort. So he varied uh, what the students were doing, their metabolic rate, you know, um, whether they were 
uh, low activity doing something like seated, uh, which is measured in terms of net. Um, uh, a low activity rate might be one with a high activity rate like running a four met. He varied how much clothing they were wearing, uh, which was measured in clo levels, down from a summer clothing uh, typical of 0.5 to a winter clothing typical of 0.1. He varied the air temperature. Uh, he varied the, the radiant temperature, which is uh, not the temperature of the air, but the temperature of the, the walls, the windows, and the ceiling. Uh, he varied the air speed indoors, and he varied the relative humidity. So checking, uh, uh, you know, trying a bunch of different experiments with different combinations of metabolic rate, insulation, air and surface temperatures, air speed and relative humidity, he asked these students basically, you know, how do you feel? He asked them to rank their comfort. And he asked them to rank this comfort on a scale of negative three for those who are very cold and positive three for those who are very hot and zero for those who are in that Goldilocks neutral zone of things being just right. Um, and then for different conditions, he took a look at what percentage of people were satisfied. Um, you know, everybody uh, was satisfied, meaning a very low percentage of dissatisfied, or were people, you know, very, very dissatisfied because they were very cold, and that percentage dissatisfied goes up to 100. So he then came up with equations based on these studies that sort of related predicted conditions, you know, with different combinations of these. How would that relate? What's the predicted mean vote? Like, are predict people going to be likely to be comfortable or not? And what's the percentage of people who will be dissatisfied? So ASHRAE, uh, uh, modern standards are all based on these on this study uh, from 1967. Um, modern standards say that a predicted mean vote of negative 0.5 to positive 0.5 is generally considered as comfortable. And as long as less than 20% of people are predicted to be dissatisfied, that's also considered as comfortable. Um, there are lots of criticisms of this study, like make no mistake, right? People, it's not really applicable for very high activity levels over like one and a half. Um, it's really only applicable for healthy adults, doesn't really apply to old people or, or, or babies. Um, it uh, may be subjective at higher levels of discomfort. Um, but there are also lots of studies where people have basically validated its applicability for that range where it applies. So even today, um, ASHRAE standard uh, 55, which was uh, an ASHRAE standard published last year, uh, they still use this uh, sort of granddaddy of, uh, of comfort metrics. Um, so it's the most common thing that you'll run into. There are different models, like the adaptive model for, for naturally ventilated spaces, but uh, those are kind of newer and a little bit beyond the scope of today's discussion. Um, so as I mentioned, for different, what this implies is for different combinations of, uh, of, of airspeed, activity levels, and clothing, there's a range of comfortable indoor conditions. So I, there's a calculator you can use online, which I've linked below here from, the, the, from Berkeley, uh, which lets you basically identify what these ranges are. So for an airspeed of 20 feet per minute, which is pretty typical for when you have the AC on, uh, you know, an activity level of one met, which is what I'm doing right now, sitting down at a computer talking, the clothing level of 0.61, which is I'm wearing a, you know, a linen shirt, light slacks, about that level. There's a, a range of indoor comfortable conditions for me uh, that can be shown by this blue band. Really, uh, temperatures ranging anywhere from 72 up to 83 degrees, depending upon very how humid it is. So generally, the drier it is outside, the higher the temperature I can tolerate wearing what I'm wearing inside right now. And the more humid that it is inside, the cooler that it has to be. Um, so you'd be kind of surprised what actually qualifies as comfortable, um, depending upon what people are wearing. And, it, and it's usually warmer. Um, most people need warmer temperatures than we're providing indoors when they're wearing shorts, t-shirts, and, uh, and typical, typical summer indoor wear. So that's how thermal comfort is measured. Um, but I want to discuss a little bit about uh, how building enclosures can influence thermal comfort. Um, so the first and foremost way of doing it is by providing an airtight, watertight, well-insulated envelope you know, with that vapor barrier in the right place to prevent condensation. Um, critical things are you should be able to take a highlighter, like is shown on the left here, and draw it around a drawing of your section, drawing of your building, and make sure that there are no gaps in the air barrier, you know, not even at junctions between the roof and the wall, at junctions between floor levels, at junctions between the windows and the wall. There should be a continuous air barrier at all of those locations. Um, uh, there should also be a, a good amount of insulation. Um, there should be that insulation is typically measured in, in R terms of R values. 
higher values stop heat flow better. A DC code actually requires a pretty healthy amount of insulation, like a R54 insulation in attic roofs, total of R20 insulation in wood frame walls. That's higher than a lot of places in the country, so it's a, it's a good starting point. Windows are usually measured in U value. Lower values are stop heat better, so it's, it works the opposite way. DC code is again pretty good. I recommend values in 0.33 for non-metal windows and 0.38 for metal windows. However, really high performance net zero buildings typically have lower U values for windows and higher values for roofs and walls, but they always are, are airtight and can pass that, uh, that highlighter air barrier test. Um, one other benefit to this is uh, it's not just thermal comfort. It doesn't just moderate those drafts and internal uh, temperatures. It also uses way less energy. So this investment in, in making an airtight insulated barrier doesn't just help with thermal comfort, it also saves energy. Um, there are other ways that you can modify the enclosure to influence thermal comfort. Um, another way is passive solar design. Um, so in North America, that means putting big windows on the south and putting overhangs over them. So that means the winter sun, when it's low in the sky in, in the south, it can actually heat up those spaces. That sunlight, which you want when it's cold in the winter, can enter through the windows and heat up your spaces. It helps if you have a thick concrete floor so that winter sun can heat that floor during the day. It can re-radiate heat overnight, kind of have that warmth uh, of when it's really cold at night. Um, during the summertime, when the summer sun is high in the sky, you want to provide shading over those same southern facing windows. So while you get that desirable diffuse light um, uh, inside, you keep that heat out so that you don't need to run your AC systems. This prevents hot spots. Uh, this keeps things kind of mellow all throughout the year. And it doesn't just keep things comfortable. It also, again, uh, saves energy. So passive solar design, not just the uh, insulation and the air barrier, but how you orient and mass your building can have a significant impact on influencing thermal comfort in buildings. Um, next, you can make uh, decisions for local discomfort. So I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but you go to kind of a, a restaurant in the winter in a cold building, like in the middle of February, maybe kind of one of those old historic buildings downtown DC. And it, and it feels uncomfortable, right? You know, it might be 75 degrees inside, but right next to the window, I, it, it feels freaking cold. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, right? Uh, one of the reasons is downdraft discomfort right? Just the window is cold because it's big and it kind of, the air cools down, rolls off the window and kind of causes a draftiness. Um, the, uh, to, to prevent that from happening, if people complain about that or you foresee that, is lower window heights, more insulative windows, you know, lower U values, and uh, using a glazing assembly that doesn't have a coating on the inside, right? So that means it'll kind of keep warmer on the inside and it'll reduce that downdraft. Um, one of the other reasons that windows can cause discomfort is radiant exchange. So just like for the same reason that, you know, when you sit in front of a campfire, you feel heat, um, or when on a hot day, you're at the beach, uh, you put it open and up an umbrella and it feels cool, even though the air temperature hasn't changed, the sun isn't beating down on you. Uh, it's the same reason sitting next to cold glass feels uncomfortable because you're losing heat to it. So good strategies here are using less glazing, Again, using more insulated glass and uh, um, increasing your, your sill height or use a glazing with a room side low E coating. So you'll notice that that's different from uh, minimizing downdraft discomfort. So sometimes what you do to uh, uh, fix one problem can cause other problems. So it's really important from a building science perspective to kind of find that balance point and consider different modalities and the ways that physical uh, a phenomenon impact your building so you can consider them and uh, kind of come to a balance. Actually, we have a very um, relevant question here. Please. Um, I'm reading it. Many buildings do not balance all of these factors well, creating hot spots, cold spots, and so forth, with which occupants solve by plugging in fans, space heaters, etc. This increases plug load, energy consume, and uh, increases greenhouse gas emissions. What role will better plug load data specific to building types, designs, and uses play in the design of deep retrofits and new buildings? Um, that is an absolutely fantastic question. Uh, thank you for asking that. Um, yes, the loads inside of buildings uh, are a critical driver for you know, how much heating and cooling is needed inside of buildings. 
Um, we've worked on uh, uh, projects that have a very high amount of plug load, uh, things like data centers that uh, uh, might actually trap heat inside if you put uh, too much insulation on it. I mean, it, you, you might actually improve the performance with, uh, with a little bit less. So having an understanding of how much plug loads and how much heat you're gonna put off inside of your building from computer equipment, cooking equipment, server equipment will have a big impact on how your envelope needs to perform and be designed. So um, once we have a better understanding of that from building owners and design teams, the envelope and HVAC systems can be right sized to minimize first costs as well as energy use and the attendant uh, environmental and economic costs that come from running HVAC systems and MEP systems more than necessary. Um, so great question. Um, Oliver, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I would say uh, in order to balance all these external and in internal factors, really it, it goes back to the building enclosure. If you cannot control that downdraft or the radiation discomfort from your building enclosure, you have to react with local measures like the space heater, your, your van, fan or other things. So for me, it's really the building enclosure to make that 100% right. Absolutely. Um, and that's why we always discuss where, uh, for air quality, for thermal comfort, always the enclosure first. Um, you know, once we've done everything we can do with passive strategies, with um, enclosure design that is responsive to the environmental factors inside and outside impacting buildings, um, we can talk about how building systems influence thermal comfort. Um, so really building systems can only influence uh, spaces and buildings in two ways, right? We can change the air inside, air-based heating and cooling, which we're all familiar with, AC units, heaters, or we can influence the surface temperatures in buildings. Um, that's called radiant heating and cooling. Common ways you've seen radiators in old buildings or in more modern buildings, uh, you can run tubes of water uh, through the ceiling or the floor, or the walls, ceiling panels to kind of moderate uh, surface temperatures. So um, you can achieve comfort in both ways. So on the left, I've kind of shown an example of what a, a space might look like with air-based cooling, right? Uh, we have a hot day, 100 degrees outside. The surface temperature of the window is 90 degrees, but the AC system is maintaining 73 inside. So while the room, while the room air temperature is 73 degrees, the average surface temperature in the, in the room is 77 degrees because of that hot window and kind of the warmer ceilings and walls, resulting in an overall room operative temperature. That's an average temperature of the air and surfaces of 75 degrees. Uh, in a radiant heating and cooling system, we might have warmer air, right, 75 degree air, but we have a cool ceiling of 60 degrees. So um, while even though our room is warmer at 75 degrees, our room radiant temperature, that average temperature of all of the surfaces is also only 75 degrees. So that operative temperature, that average temperature we see and kind of feel is 75 as well. So it's not just about thermostat set points. That was uh, kind of what I wanted to get at before is even when it comes to temperature, it's not just the air temperature that influences, it's also the surface temperatures. So even though it's really more common to use air-based heating and cooling systems in this country, um, Radiant heating and cooling systems can also uh, have uh, work just as well. Um, one of the reasons that I bring this up here is, uh, is because there's a difference in energy usage. So you can transport a lot more heat with water than you can with air. Um, this is an easy experiment that you can do at home, right? You can turn your oven on to 150 degrees and you can put a pot of water on your stove and heat it to 150 degrees. If you stick your hand in the oven for five seconds, you'll be totally fine. You stick your hand in the pot of water for five seconds, you will not be fine. This is yeah, don't don't do that, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm assuming we're all adults here. Yes, disclaimer, please don't do that at home. But uh, as, a, as an experiment, it shows uh, that water is a more effective carrier of heat than air. Um, so that means you can transport the same amount of heat in a lot less, with a lot less water than you can with air. This has great impacts on buildings. You know, you need less space, uh, you can have smaller systems, but it's also more energy efficient and saves energy. So it's food for thought that there are energy efficient systems that provide thermal comfort just as well as air-based systems. 
So that's one way that building systems can respond to thermal comfort. Um, so moving on to visual comfort, any other questions, Oliver, on thermal comfort or are we good to go? No more questions, but we did pass the 55 minute mark. Okay, I'm gonna move that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up here at uh, an hour and fifteen, so maybe fifteen minutes at the end of our uh, of our hour and a half pre presentation allotment. So thank you. Um, looking at visual comfort, uh, so visual comfort is is important for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the most important factors is daylight and views. Uh, there have been a ton of studies that show the importance of daylight, uh, not just artificial light, but daylight. It's been associated with improved mood, better morale, less fatigue, and, and, and reduced eye strain in studies as far back as 86. A 99 study uh, showed that 60% of office workers said that they prefer having direct sunlight. 2002 study showed that uh, there was an improvement of 15% um, in employee productivity, uh, holding all things other constant, just uh, except for buildings with better daylight conditions. And studies of home buyers show that uh, um, that over 60% of home buyers rank it as an important uh, criteria. So I'm showing a building here. It's called the Licht Active House in Hamburg, Germany. It's a building designed to maximize natural light. It's not only a pleasant environment that's good for people, it also saves a lot of energy. This graph that we're looking at on the left is how often the lights run in the kitchen that you're looking at on the right. Uh, the top to bottom is you know midnight to midnight. The left to the right is uh, January through December. So you can see in that band between sunrise and sunset, the blue line and the red line, the kitchen lights hardly run at all. And uh, um, having that daylight you know, is not only good for people, but it's good for energy use as well. Um, keeping things visually comfortable isn't just about providing uh, light. It's about providing the right level of light. Um, there are many levels of light that are uh, the different levels of, of light that are important for different tasks um, ranging. It's usually measured in lux or foot candle. Um, for one foot candle is about 10 lux. So uh, either unit works everywhere from down from, you know, 50 lux in, uh, in, in dark areas all the way up to 20,000 lux in a space like surgery. Um, it's not just about the amount of light. It's also about the temperature of the light, the color temperature, um, different tasks for different reasons. Uh, warm lights with lower temperature ranges around 3,000 are good for residential use. Intermediate temperatures, 35 to 4,100 are, are good for work sites, while high temperatures like five to 6,000 are, are good for uh, uh, high, uh, high performance tasks or for high cli hot climates. Yeah, actually high temperature lights make people feel cooler in warm climates. So it's an interesting effect. Um, the color temperature also depends on how bright lights are. Um, when the brighter the, brighter the lights, uh, 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 the, the higher of a temperature looks better. So glare is also important. Uh, glare happens whenever there's a source of light directly in your visual field. Uh, that can be caused by natural lighting, like the, the sunlight causing glare that you see in the visualization here, or it can be caused by artificial lighting as well. Um, there's a few key performance indicators for, maintain, for measuring uh, whether you're getting enough light and daylight and uh, to make sure that you're not getting too much for, from glare. Uh, these are called spatial daylight autonomy. Uh, meaning that for any space within your room, uh, if you just put a point, that you'd be getting at least 300 lux for at least 50% of the time throughout your year. Um, annual sun exposure shows areas that are getting too much light, more than 1,000 lux, more than 250 hours a year. That's too much uh, light. So at the top, we have a classroom situation. That's good. On the left, we have um, a, a good amount of spatial daylight. That means for about 54% of the space, is getting at least 300 lux at least 50% of the time. Um, and there's not a lot of glare. Only 10% of the space gets more than 1,000 lux 250 hours of the year. You can see that it kind of looks nice inside as well. A, a, a poorer design uh, has less daylight autonomy, meaning only a very small area of the building uh, gets enough daylight throughout the year, while a much larger area of it actually gets too much. So these criteria are essential for, for assessing visual comfort. Building enclosures can influence visual comfort in many ways. Ceilings should be uh, highly reflective so that light that comes in can be reflected down. Uh, walls should be more matte uh, so that they don't reflect glare directly into people's eyes. Floors should be a little bit darker than the walls and ceilings, again, to, in, uh, to avoid glare. While windows should be just right to uh, allow in enough light, uh, but not too much light. Um, there are other uh, strategies that can be used to, to, to influence how light comes in. 
things like light redirecting film, which you can see at the top left that takes direct light and points it towards the ceiling. Light shelves that are, are basically shelves that do the same. Fritted glass that shade windows while still allowing light to come in. Skylights and, uh, and solar redirecting devices, which collect sunlight from roofs and put it and redirect it inside like light fixtures and translucent walls. Um, building systems can also influence visual comfort. Um, not putting artificial lights uh, directly in the path of, uh, of, of people's visions, keeping them at least 45 degrees above the field of view can reduce glare from artificial lights. Um, uniform distribution of lights prevents glare. So, you know, whether you have a general illumination source on uh, strategy or whether you have task lighting with lights on top, um, it's important that you maintain a ratio of not more than three to one between the brightness at your work surface, uh, that, that visual task, to the, uh, uh, to the general illumination in general. Um, it's also important when you have uh, daylight, daylight in your spaces to provide daylighting controls that automatically dim artificial lighting in response to increased daylight levels. So in these ways, building systems can influence and respond uh, to improve visual comfort and again, improve uh, energy performance. Um, Lastly, uh, we talk about acoustic comfort. Um, so acoustic comfort, uh, the key performance indicator for that is, uh, um, is decibels, really how loud it is. Uh, so uh, there are different sources, such as the ASHRAE Handbook of uh, Applications that show what acceptable noise levels are inside different spaces. This is just a small selection of it. There's a, a huge table here. It's really important to note that the decibel scale isn't linear. So a difference in three, an increase in three decibels means a sound that's twice as loud. So when we talk about a decibel level of 35 to a decibel level of 45, right? That's an increase of nine. So that means something is getting twice, 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 right? So that's eight times louder of a noise. So it's really important to, to keep that in mind. Um, building enclosures and systems can influence acoustic comfort in many ways, you know, providing things like spring isolators and Sound dampening sections to HVAC can cut down on HVAC noise while providing, uh, you know, soundproofing and uh, soundproof glass can influence uh, sounds from neighbors, other tenants, and, and outside. Um, so going to stop there. Uh, that was our uh, uh, discussion of uh, internal uh, indoor environmental quality. Going to spend the last 10 or 12 minutes talking about resource use in terms of energy, water, and carbon emissions. But any other questions before we proceed? There are currently no questions, and we are precisely at the 65 minute mark. All right, sounds good. Uh, we're getting to the last 10 minutes here, so I will stop at uh, uh, the 75 minute mark to allow some additional questions. So, we discussed those indoor environmental uh, um, uh, quality key performance indicators air quality, thermal comfort, visual comfort, acoustic comfort and uh, why they're important, but also how they impact uh, resource use. We noted that maintaining those qualities, um, doing it via, via the enclosure is a passive way of moderating it, which doesn't incur any energy use, but doing it via building systems, MEP systems, does incur energy, energy use. So um, where does the energy use go in buildings? Uh, what we're looking at here is an eight-story, 130,000 square foot office located in Northwest DC. Um, it's a pretty new building that's pretty well insulated, um, but there are, here are the major places that energy in buildings go. It goes to space heating, space cooling, fans, pumps, um, service hot water, um, elevators and escalators, uh, lighting, and plug loads. It's pretty common that in DC that lighting, space cooling, and space heating really dominate office buildings. This breakdown, though, might look totally different for a hotel or a store or a university building or a residential building right here in DC. So understanding where your energy usage goes in building is, uh, is, is really important. Um, to do this, there's a technique called energy modeling uh, that uh, um, allows you to kind of predict and understand where buildings use energy, even if you don't have uh, submeters. Um, DCSEU uh, is hosting another webinar on this subject, uh, energy modeling to understand uh, building energy use. Um, that we, Baum and Consulting, are providing. That's on September 8th. So mark your calendars, and we'll discuss this in uh, a lot more detail then. Um, it's also important to understand uh, energy use intensity um, in buildings, uh, site versus source. 
So you're all used to talking about site energy use. So that, that breakdown we looked is at is where the building uses energy on its site. So that's like what you get from utility bills. Um, it accounts for heating, pumps, fans, et cetera, et cetera. It's what you use in your building. Um, however, it's important to also consider source energy, right? So that's not just what you use inside of your building, but how, what, how much energy it took it to get there. So sure, you might've used 10 kilowatt hours of electricity, but you know how much coal was burned, how much transmission losses were there to, to bring that to you. So source energy, accounts for those generation and transmission losses and is a more equitable means of, of discussing uh, um, energy use. So as an example here at the top, <clears throat> you might use 32 units of electricity um, in your building, but uh, you know it, there was a 6% distribution losses, 64% uh, efficiency losses in generating that. And it might've been a 5% uh, efficiency loss in bringing the coal or the natural gas or whatever was needed to burn it. So even though you only use 32 units at home, it took 100 units of uh, energy to bring that to you. So electricity is actually really expensive <coughs> in terms of source energy. Natural gas, on the other hand, if you use 92 units of energy at home, it only takes 10 units of energy at the source to bring that to you. So it's important to consider how much uh, source and how much goes into bringing you the energy you do, not just uh, uh, what you're using. It's just like what you eat, right? It's not just what you're eating, but what it took to bring that food to you. Um, there are site and source factors that are provided from the US. So electricity on average, for every unit of electricity that you use in your building, you're using 2.8 times that to actually generate and bring it to you. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on-site solar or wind obviously has a ratio of one what you use is what you get. Um, so all these other sources of energy, steam, hot water, chilled water, wood, et cetera, are hovering around one, um, uh, 1.2, but electricity as it stands right now is, uh, is really expensive. So if you have an all electric building, it's really important to uh, make sure that you're considering energy efficiency. Um, one way of judging your building's energy efficiency is the Energy Star score. So the EPA uh, maintains a program called the uh, um, called Energy Star, uh, which has a platform called Portfolio Manager. It basically allows building owners to go in. It's a free platform that allows you to enter utility bills, and it'll calculate your source energy for you, and it'll compare you to similar buildings nationwide. So if you it gives you a score. So if you have a score of 50, you're right on average with other similar peer buildings nationwide. Um, if you perform above 50, that means you're doing better than peer buildings nationwide. And if you're performing below 50, that means you're doing worse than buildings nationwide. Um, the reason I bring this up today is, again, this score is, is going to become very important for buildings in DC. Um, the new DC Building Energy Performance Standards, BEPS, um, they judge, it'll, it, it basically assesses buildings based on their Energy Star score. Buildings must meet the Energy Star score target for uh, their building type, or they'll be non-compliant and may face uh, um, significant ramifications uh, for that. So it's really important if you're a building owner or a consultant working on a project to understand what the Energy Star's target is for your building and how that might impact you uh, in the future. As we kind of discussed, the best ways of hitting energy performance goals is to follow the loading order. Just like you reduce, reuse, recycle, you start with passive strategies, which means investing in the unclosure. You know, control those physical phenomenon. Uh, for what you can't control by the enclosure, then focus on providing efficient, optimized systems. High efficiency HVAC, maybe water-based HVAC when you have to provide it. Um, thirdly, look at shared resources. Uh, instead of wasting, you know, if you if you uh, instead of wasting things like uh, like exhaust air that goes outside of your building employ energy recovery ventilation to, to, to recover some of that, that waste and bring it back. And lastly, but not least, after you've done maximized everything passively, optimize your systems and recovered your waste, then and only then do you talk about providing on-site renewables. For buildings, it really looks like first optimizing your, your facade, your enclosure, then optimizing your lighting, and finally optimizing your HVAC in that order. So do it in that order and you'll typically maximize your both energy performance as well as your financial performance. Um, wanted to spend the last couple of minutes uh, talking about uh, water use and carbon emissions. 
So water use is sometimes secondary to buildings. Um, it's less complicated, it's more demand focused, but it is very important and it also impacts energy use. So I wanted to talk about two real things that are important in the DC market. Um, number one is EPA water sense label fixtures. Um, this thing, uh, they, they basically are low flow fixtures that, are, that come with this label on them. If you own a building or designing a building or have any or are looking to upgrade your own fixtures, highly recommend you look, at, look for these. Um, they typically can uh, uh, change and save about 700 gallons of water per year per fixture. Um, they also make irrigation fixtures that can save 15,000 gallons of water per year. It's about on average four gallons of water every time you shower. Um, so employing these in designs is, is quite important. Secondarily, uh, planning for xeriscaping escaping, um, that refers to drought tolerant landscapes that don't really have any watering requirements. Ideally, you don't need to irrigate it at all. Just the water that you receive is enough. Um, these two strategies, low flow fixtures and, uh, and xeriscaping, escaping are the, are the most important to control building water usage when it comes to resource consumption. Um, last but not least, I wanna talk about carbon emissions. Um, there are two types of carbon emissions that, that, that buildings really incur in terms of resource use. Number one is operational carbon. Uh, that's the carbon associated with the electricity and the gas use um, from that generating and that distribution, which everybody here is probably familiar with. Um, the strategies that we discussed today for energy savings and water savings will reduce operational carbon emissions. However, um, the second part of it is also embodied carbon. That's the emissions from manufacturing, transporting, and installing the building materials. So the, car, the, the wood, the steel, the concrete, the glass, how all of that impacts buildings. So right now, um, it's predicted that from 2020 to 2050, the embodied carbon emissions um, associated with buildings will grow to about 50%. So while it's really critical that we talk about passive strategies to improve the indoor environmental quality and use less resources in terms of energy, water, and, uh, and energy and water, it's really critical for designers and owners to start thinking about what types of materials they use and how that impacts carbon emissions if we're gonna get serious about environmental impact of buildings. Um, lastly, economic performance. Again, um, we're, uh, there is gonna be a webinar on September 8th uh, discussing uh, the energy usage and energy modeling in buildings that'll go into significant detail about the economic performance of buildings, but wanted to tell, give you guys a quick uh, um, anecdote from a net zero project that we worked on, the Brock Environmental Center in Virginia Beach, which is a net zero operating building. Um, you know, the, there, the owner and the design team were really focused on PV, uh, you know, for, for energy efficiency and, and high performance. Um, but you know that doesn't follow the loading order uh, where passive strategies come first. And uh, we really were, uh, uh, were agitating for super high levels of insulation, which isn't very common in Virginia Beach. And uh, everybody kind of balked about it. Um, but we ran the energy assessment to see how much energy it would save um, uh, for installing this amount of, uh, of insulation at a cost of $22,000 per year and uh, we realized that we would actually need to provide 35 PV panels to offset the same amount of energy that was saved by installing this insulation, which would have cost $44,000 per year. So even though it wasn't common or expected, um, when you think about it from this systems perspective, it was worth investing $22,000 into the enclosure passive component to save $44,000 in the more active MEP component. So that's again that that loading order that you can follow can help significantly offset the cost of making more effective buildings. So for more about that, uh, come join DCSEU's webinar on September 8th. So that's really it for today. Um, you know, we discussed the building science as the study of buildings as a system, including the physical phenomena that impacts it. Uh, we studied, uh, we discussed how a well-performing building improves the productivity and satisfaction of its occupants to the benefit of building owners, which can have a significant economic benefit. And we talked about how an understanding of building science can allow building designers to influence indoor environmental quality and resource demand, specifically via the building enclosure and systems. And finally, that an integrated building science focused approach that starts with passive strategies can maximize both IEQ and building resource demand. Um, wanted to close it out with a final anecdote um, that we like to talk about at our firm um, is this project, the Leaf City by Martin Janson. 
which is a, a study where this architect really looked at a, at, at a leaf. He kind of saw how these different components in, in a leaf sort of formed the elements of the commu community, you know, the streets, the buildings, the blocks, kind of that urban fabric. And he was inspired to, to come up with an urban design of buildings and, and communities based on that. And this idea is, is, is really appealing to us from a building science perspective because it's treating the community as a system of components. Um, you know, building science is also about treating uh, buildings as systems of components. So just as for a successful community, you need to consider everything that makes it up together. So uh, as, a, as a whole, greater than the sum of its parts, so too for buildings to make them highly performant in terms of IEQ and building resource management, that you think of them as a system that is uh, made of components that are greater than the sum of its parts. So thank you everybody for joining. Sorry, I went five minutes over, but we have 10 minutes for questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Archie. And we have currently one question. I think this is an excellent segue in a broader conversation. The question is, what incentives, tax or other, does DC provide to optimize energy efficiency in existing and new buildings? And uh, I'm not sure if anyone from DCSEU is on the call on, on the webinar, but um, DCSEU has various programs. Um, and incentive programs to uh, well, help with energy efficiency upgrades. Um, Ajit, are you aware of any other tax incentives? I'm not too firm. Yeah, with there's, a great, there's a great resource that people can check out called the Desire Database. It's D-S-I-R-E. Um, I will update this slide deck to, to include that before we distribute it, but you can just Google it. And that is a, a, a database that of incentives for every single location. So you can simply just punch in your, uh, um, uh, your zip code into that database, and it'll provide you a comprehensive list of all federal, state, and local tax incentives, um, uh, uh, grants, funding programs that are available for different building types within your, within your location. So wherever you are, that's my first recommendation to, to start. Um, there are uh, uh, things, for example, uh, for specific HVAC technologies and for complying with uh, specific certifications. Okay. okay. And I just put the website into the, the chat. Okay. And there is another question in the chat. Does EPA set the standard temperature for government buildings? Uh, I don't, I there, I don't think the EPA does. I'll bet that the GSA does that, that they probably maintain the standards and uh, uh, for that, but it probably is based ultimately on, uh, on guidelines and practices from an industry association like ASHRAE or something else. And I, I do know that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has very clear guidelines for military facilities. Correct. <coughs> Let's see if we can. There's one more question. Can you read that, Archit? Uh, sure, one second. So I've got a question that says, I manage storefront improvements around the district. Would like to find more. Okay, sorry. Oh, no, so never mind. That's something else. I think that's more some networking that's going on there. <coughs> So any other questions? I'm going to allow everybody to talk here slowly. So if you would like to as well, you can uh, uh, um, go ahead and unmute yourself. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, um, I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, thank you for coming and joining and asking a ton of great questions during the webinar. Um, this webinar will be recorded and uh, posted on DCSEU's website along with the, uh, um, the, the PDF of the presentation itself. <coughs> so thanks again, everybody for attending. Uh, wanted to again plug our uh, energy modeling for BEPS webinar uh, happening on September 8th where we will continue this discussion and dive in a little bit deeper as to how to determine 
what strategies to employ for buildings uh, seeking to improve their energy efficiency and sustainability performance. So thank you all very much and uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye.